Hiya! Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino, and this is episode number 97. What's good, everybody? How you doing? Good afternoon to everyone, and good morning, good evening, wherever you may be in this world, listening from all over the interwebs. It's I, your Lord and Savior, Agostino, here to wish you another happy podcast episode. Uh, it's a bit late today. Um, I came back a little bit late for my run, but I did get it in. And even though you know I slept quite late last night, you always tend to do that. And whenever you have a day off, you always tend to sleep later the day before. Even though if you sleep the same time that you usually do when you go to work, you can sometimes get more out of the day. So that's a weird little um thing that humans do, or that I do in general. You know what I mean? You, t- you tend to stay up a bit late. No, you know what? I've got day off. I'm gonna stay up late. I'm gonna do stuff, do stuff, do stuff. I didn't do jack shit. You know what I mean? Like Reddit ended up dying between the hours of like 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. So I ended up spending most of my time just staring at, at, at the ceiling. It's weird, isn't it, how when one site that you kind of like go to for all your news and all your information and all your no, news, information and entertainment goes down, you're just left in lurch. Then I had to kind of like scroll through Twitter and look at um, VMA reacts and stuff and it was just fucking shit for the most part. See the same seven outfits rotated from people saying this person slayed, that person did this. For the most part, it was just an absolute garbage shit show. So I ended up spending most of my time looking at the ceiling, contemplating my life decisions. But I'm here now. So all is well in the hood. All is well in the hood. I got a nice little free mile run this morning. So I'm feeling very strong, very powerful. I have to say, I'm having run now for the best part of three weeks more than three times a week, I kind of do feel my endurance kind of coming back where it used to be before. I'm not as knackered as I was at the end when I first started. And as I, mean, as I keep mentioning all the time, running outside, actual cardio work, running, doing sprints, doing laps, doing hill sprints, um, running around the block, running a time, uh, a time trial kind of pace is much harder than doing any sort of set in a gym. I don't care what anyone says. Back squat, overhead press, um, Whatever you're going to do, dumbbell curls, do you know what I mean? Like hammers. I don't care. Running outside is much harder than that. I don't care what it is. Even maybe uh, muscle fatigue might feel worse because you get that cramp in the morning where you can't actually can't like move your arms and it hurts to brush your teeth sometimes if you work, um, if you don't kind of work, if you don't kind of like split the days up in the right way or you don't get the kind of rest period. Or sometimes even if you just work in general anyway, you're just going to get that kind of soreness in your muscles and that might hurt. But I think overall the the searing pain that goes through every single part of your muscles when you're running the lactic acid that's running through every piece of flesh on you right that pain cannot be replicated anywhere else i don't care anyone says i can't be replicated and it's something that annoyingly only gets better the more you do it right it's one of those weird things where like running is so shitty in the beginning right it feels so horrible you kind of feel like you're out of breath in the first 10 minutes or so but then it only gets better the more times you do it. So if you do it more often, you get better. But if you do it more often, you have to really have uh, an iron will. You know what I mean? A resolve that kind of like is, can be not, cannot be broken under any circumstances. Because whenever you run, I think more so than gym, when I, I, I get the, that fucking inner head, that thought in my head, that kind of like lizard brain starts ticking over and starts telling you, look, why don't you just stop? Why don't you just run two miles? Why don't you just do a mile and a half? Why don't you just walk the rest of the way home? Like it's constantly there, nagging away at your brain. But I don't get that in the gym. When I'm when I'm in a gym and I want to do a set, even if I'm doing like, usually when I go to the gym, I split it up and I do like a strength, I kind of do like a strength workout in the beginning. So between 20 minutes to half an hour. And that's usually the standard stuff like bench press, back squat, overhead press, deadlifts. Um, I might do some dumbbell curls, might do some dumbbell overhead presses and shit. I might do some kettlebell swings. I just stand this strength stuff. Right? Slowly, I try and do them as slow as possible to kind of, and, and make sure I do correct form just to kind of build up that muscular endurance, right? And then the last half, the kind of like last half an hour or last 20 minutes of my workout, so I kind of split it in two. So half an hour at the beginning, half an hour at the end. I usually uh, concentrate that on the wad. And that's like a workout of the day that I'll just pick on the website. So I'll go on CrossFit.com or I'll go on CrossFit Invictus, which is a gym out, I think, in California. And they post like workouts every day. I'll just pick one. And I'll just go for it, right? I'll just kind of smash it out. And it's usually like an AMRAP, which is like an um, every minute on the minute, is it? Is that? Every minute on the rim, is that AMRAP? I know, as AMRAP is as many rounds as possible. 
So I'll do an AMRAP, I'll do an e EMOM, that's an every minute on the minute on the minute workout. So that means like you might get a workout and it might be like, so every minute on the minute you do this certain workout. So it's kind of like, it's forcing you to do it as quickly as possible. And then there's other things like circuit training stuff that you do. So that's kind of what I do, right? And I've never in my whole time doing those kind of workouts have I ever had my lizard brain ticking and go, I guess, you know, stop, stop. You should not do so many dumbbell curls. Why don't you just give up now? Why don't you just go home? It never happens, but it always happens when you're running without any, without um, any exception. I always get that fucking lizard brain running and today it was happening at kind of like mile one and a half i'm running along having a good old time and all of a sudden my head goes hey why don't you just stop why don't you just run why don't you just run to your mile why don't you just relax and da -da -da? it's like nah i've got to get it in now and i've kind of done this thing now where i'm trying to run i'm trying to do i'm i think i'm going to attempt to do five days in a row this time so it'll take me over to it'll take me all the way across the saturday um which is going to be a bit difficult because i've got a dj gig on a friday and then i'm gonna be I'm assuming I'll be somehow intoxicated in the morning still, so I'll be a slightly hungover on a Saturday. I've got a bit of work to do on a Saturday morning, so then I've got to go run afterwards. So I've still got, you know, I've got to pack it all in, and then I might go carnival on Sunday. Uh, no, actually, I've got, I'm DJing again on Sunday, so imagine I've got absolute chocolate block weekend. So I've got to kind of like get it all in before Sunday. And then Sunday I'm DJing, and then Monday I might go to carnival. So it's kind of all kind of got to be jam packed in. So I'm kind of trying to push myself and see if I can do that this week. Just to kind of, you know, test a little resolve. But yeah, running is fucking difficult, man. Don't let anyone tell you that. Don't let anyone tell you it isn't. Especially when you're trying to run correctly. Like I said before. Um, if you're just trying to like slog it through, like I see some people just flailing their arms everywhere. Like just, I mean, just kind of like always bouncing up and down and just kind of letting gravity take you where it wants to take you. Then of course it can just be, I don't know. It could be one of those kind of things that you put yourself through. But if you're kind of trying to run with a bit of form, you're trying to keep a particular kind of, you're trying to keep a certain type of pace. Um then it can be very difficult, especially especially up here mentally. But you know, we're getting it, we're getting through it, we're concentrating it. And as ever, I mentioned before, I kind of prefer running outside anyway. I'm 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 actually happy I'm not in that gym because as great as my local gym is, it's a local hood gym, it's a local council gym. Let's say for the most for the for the more politically correct term. But it's just you know the lack of air conditioning in there. There's no air conditioning number one. There's no windows or some sh well. There's no windows that you can really open and then get some air in or feel the air inside it. I'm assuming it has to do something to do with um, health and safety. Maybe because there's a swimming pool in there, they can't actually. I don't know what it is, but it's something to. They don't really have windows for that. Mo they have windows, but they don't have windows you can open. They have windows you can see outside to get some natural light in, but no nothing that makes you feel like you haven't get you get any recycling or fresh air in. Um, there's no air conditioning and it's a real like sweat box. Like it, it really traps heat very very well unfortunately for the people that are inside so you end up sweating a lot ends up getting really sticky in the air and stuff so this this feels uncomfortable so i don't i'm not really a fan of going in and i'll probably kind of go back when the kind of temperature kind of cools down a bit i'm happy just to like train outside do my body weight exercises in a gym i'm in, in the open park that i've got next to me in stratford near westfield and kind of going from there but yeah apart from that everything else is feeling amazing and good and ready to go so i'm gonna mix things up a little bit this podcast and talk a little bit about football because I don't know I don't necessarily talk about football just because it kind of gets me upset. You know, being a United fan nowadays is not the best time to be a United fan. You know, it's kind of it's probably a good thing for everyone else. I think for the diehard fans because it's probably weeded out loads of the glory hunters, people that are just in it for the good times. But for us United fans who are who've kind of seen this day come in, it's kind of like it feels even more painful to kind of see it play out, right? So. Of course, as you might have known, or if you're not aware from football, uh, United started the season a little bit iffy. We won our first game against Leicester, but we didn't win in a convincing fashion. We were a bit underwhelming in that performance too. And then we kind of come up against uh, Brighton, who were one of the teams that were tipped to go down this season, right? Um, not lacking in quite a lot of quality in the team overall. And they ended up beating us comprehensively 3-2. It should have been really 3-1 in general, but they ended up beating us without any sort of effort, 3-2 very, very easily. And the issue is, I think a lot of people have mentioned it, um, no one's really um, that annoyed when a big team loses to a little team. I think it happens all the time, right? I think that's the beauty of the Premier League. Unlike La Liga, unlike maybe Serie A in some respects, or League A, um, the Premier League, some of the top teams have to always be on their guard because when you go and visit a, a smaller side away from home, for them, that's their, like, that's their Champions League final, right? It's annoying for bigger teams because usually 
they'll that smaller team will beat you and then they'll go to face a team that's within their kind of like range and they end up getting absolutely smashed right so it's a bit annoying because like you know they only turn up when the big boys are around right so it's for fans it's annoying that their clubs do that but it's it's normal right if you're brighton and may night is coming to town it's a big game for everyone involved right there might be players in the brighton side who are let go from a top flight premier league teams they might be brand players um in that squad who were part of an academy united squad back in the day who got released and were told they're never going to make it so everyone's got kind of like a point to prove right and plus there's the players in the brighton side who kind of always have aspirations of making it to the um to a bigger side right so they kind of also want to impress to maybe i don't know maybe catch the eye of Mourinho, maybe catch the eye of other other uh top four kind of managers who are also watching that game and seeing how many they perform so it's no, it's not a bother when you kind of lose to those kind of teams, right? Because it happens, but the the it's the manner of the defeat that's always kind of an issue for a big side, right? You don't want to go to a smaller side and just be beaten convincingly. You want to go there and you want to have a you know the kind of games where you face a smaller side and they take all their chances, but you don't take any of yours. It's just one of those weird iffy games that happen in you know it's just one of those once in a lifetime things that happen where it's like they have three shots on target, they score all of theirs, you have twenty five and don't score one. Those things can happen, right? And every, you can kind of, the fans can still walk away angry. Uh, players can be disappointed themselves. But overall, you know, you put a good effort in and you lost because you kind of gave away free opportunities which you shouldn't have and they kind of punish you for it. So it's a good lesson. It's a good wake-up call for everyone involved. But when you start the game the way United did, lethargic, slow, timid, um, it looked like none of the players wanted to be there, right? And then you give... And then you give away two really soft goals in the beginning. And then you give away another third when we just score another one to make it 2-1. There's no way you're going to win that game, right? The, that's, that's how brutal the Premier League is. I think in La Liga, you could easily see Real Madrid come back, even playing horribly, and probably winning that game 5-3, right? But it does happen in the Premier League. Premier League, Premier League is one of the most ruthless leagues in that, in that regard. It's like, well, if, you give a team a, if you give a team a sniff, or if you if you allow them to realize that maybe you're not as good as do as good as they think you are, they're just gonna punish you and they're gonna make sure that they close out the game and win. And they did. And of course we made Brighton's jobs much easier because we didn't really we didn't really go after them that much. We didn't really test their goalkeeper as much as we should have. We didn't stretch their defense. We didn't really dominate midfield. Our strikers were quite ineffective. Un Our defenders were worrisome the whole entire game. So it just kept compiling issue after issue after issue. And now the the kind of question that's permeating around uh with united fans and football pundits and people commentators in general is where do united go next right because we can see quite clearly that this Mourinho experiment hasn't worked right because the issue is when you get someone in like Mourinho in you know you know what Mourinho is exactly what he says on the, on the tin right he's a manager for the here and now he's a manager who's going to deliver you results right away right that's that's his kind of modus operandi right so a manager like that doesn't necessarily come in and coach players in that respect. He's not someone who's going to build a football philosophy. Someone's going to come in, he's going to identify the weak spots, and he's going to bring in players to kind of like um, uh, help the team out. And he's also going to promote the players who he thinks can do a good job for him, who can battle, who can fight, who can kind of die on their shield. And he's going to kind of go and battle through, right? Kind of like build his team up from the defense upwards and kind of make sure they're hard to beat, but also make sure they're clinical up front. But we haven't had that with United for for uh, for some time, really. Maybe since Abrahamovic, we haven't really had that balance of like having a really solid defense and a clinical person up front that could kind of help us and dig us out of a hole. Because even when Abrahamovic during his last couple of seasons, he kind of had those seasons. He kind of had those um, seasons where we'd be playing really badly, but because he's such an expert finisher, because he's been played at such a high level for such a long time, he was able to dig us out of big holes by scoring uh, the one chance he got, right? And that would maybe help us niggle 2-1, whatever victory it is. But that's highly reliant on you having actual specialists in positions, right? You have to have a real, really good defenders. You have to have warriors playing for you in order to kind of protect you. And then you have to have absolute clinical marksmen up front that can just like dispatch goals, right? You can kind of see the similar um, kind of balance happen at Porto, the similar sort of balance happen at Inter Milan. And for lack of a better term, the similar sort of happened at Real Madrid. But the real good example of that is what happened at Chelsea, right? With Ricardo Cavallo and John Terry in, in defense and then Drogba, Ian Robin, all those guys playing up front. You had a clinic, you had a kind of that balance of like a really strong base, and a really clinical people up front. And plus he had, a, you know, one of the best, he had probably one of the best midfielders in Frank Lampard coming in and arriving late on goal. Unfortunately, times have changed. Um, footballing philosophies and approaches have kind of evolved a little bit, uh, have evolved somewhat. And nowadays, 
teams aren't necessarily getting away with that. You can't just get away with that. You can't, teams are changing their system six, seven, eight, nine times during a game, right? Their approach or how they're playing. So that means during the training, um, during the training sessions, they're implementing different styles of play, right? They might have a common theme. They kind of have an overall kind of umbrella that they kind of operate under. But once the, once a team sort of figures them out in the game, they kind of switch it up. You're seeing a lot of that stuff happen with uh, Man City, right? Um, Pep Guardiola is kind of waxing lyrical about Benjamin, Med Benjamin Mendy. Why? Because he's like a conventional right back and kind of get up and down. But he was also a bit, a little bit like a winger, right? He's got the, he's got kind of like that. Danny Alves final ball where he can actually find people he's not just like going down a wing like Valencia does kick run cross right he's not just like smashing in the area for no, for no one he's actually going down the wing uh, hugging the touchline and actually picking people out in the in the middle which gives Manchester City a different approach right because they can now lock it long with Edison they can knock it out wide with either um, Benjamin Medi or Kyle Walker on the other side. They've got options on either end that they can lock it on the, on the wings and cross balls in, or they can just keep on playing their position-based football in the middle. But you have to have these different styles of play in order to kind of combat the teams that you're kind of facing up uh, against in Premier League, especially the promoted teams, and especially the teams that are kind of fighting for their survival, because those are the teams who are going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that you guys don't win, right? It's just a kind of... That's why in effect, kind of winning the Premier League is such a big deal because you're having to face so many different kind of opponents every single week, plus your European games, plus your League Cup games, plus your FA Cup games. It's just like a constant, your mind is constantly kind of churning, 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 trying to figure out your opponent. And unfortunately, Mourinho hasn't found a way of figuring it out. It could be the fact that he came, he came into my United side that was on this way, on its kind of like on the wane. There was there were so many holes in the squad that needed to be addressed. Van Gaal tried to address them, but they did. But he didn't have enough time. Um, the players that were there, who kind of, who are quite average, or are kind of given long contracts or on obscene salaries. I even point someone like Ashley Young, who even though he's had a good season and he kind of got rewarded with going to England, he's he's a player who's not a specialist right right back at any any stretch of the imagination. Isn't a specialist left back at all. Probably shouldn't be playing at a high level at, on right wing for any club for the most part. He probably is uh, at least maybe a top 10 mid-table kind of quality player. But he's kind of being kept at Man United because for the most part, you know, he's on high wages. No one's going to take him off our hands. We had the same issue with Fellaini. Um, so we've had all these players in our, in our team who are, we found very hard to let go or very hard to kind of get rid of, right? Because they're on such high wages and teams couldn't make our valuations. And plus the players wouldn't want to go for drastically... Uh, lower wages than what they were on before at United. So we end up with this weird mishmash of a side that was in various stages of experience, various um, ages, and just a, no real specialist in their position. Everyone was kind of a bit of a generous everywhere you look on the defence, especially in, in, in defence, especially in, in defence, which is Mourinho's kind of like main part of the team that he has to get right. And he has a bit to blame too for it because that game against Brighton, two of his uh, big signings in defence play together. Now, granted, they haven't played together a lot because both of them have been quite injured or they've been out of favour in the case of Lindelof. And sometimes even with Eric Bailly, they've been fit, but they haven't played like towards the end of last season. So they finally played together against uh, Brighton. They're both pretty athletic. They're both pretty fast. They're both quite physical, if not strong. They're not the strongest, but they're quite physical in that regard, right? So you think they'd be able to kind of compete with Glenn Murray and the other Brighton players, but they got absolutely dominated the whole entire game. They got run circles around. Everybody had an absolute shocker, made mistake after mistake after mistake, inadvertently conceded two goals, gave away the corner, which led to the goal, gave away the penalty, led to the goal. Linderhoff was, was out of position consistently, loads of last dish tackles, which has been kind of the common theme of, you know, whenever you see United defending, there's always an outstretched leg. There's, Phil Jones is kind of an example of it, of why he kind of really annoys me, right? He's always having to recover, like stick his head somewhere, outstretch his leg, which kind of shows he's not in the right position, right? It's kind of about overcompensating for being in the wrong position in the first place. So that continues going on. And then last season, we were lucky because, that, you know, De Gea had one of his, like, you know, amazing seasons once again and was saving every shot that came near his way. But unfortunately, if your goalkeeper isn't playing 10 out of 10 and has an 8 out of 10 game like he did against Brighton, and your defenders have a 4 out of 10 game, you're going to concede three goals. So the base that you're playing with isn't good enough. The midfield that you got is kind of a midfield that he doesn't really know where his best lineup is. He's still mixing and matching. Fred is kind of new players, coming to a new, new team. He still hasn't figured it out yet. Then there's the issue with Pogba. There's obviously a problem between Mourinho and Pogba. They obviously have some kind of beef, 
right? Because Pogba doesn't look like he wants to play for the manager. Mourinho kind of always sending these weird subliminals to Pogba that kind of don't make any sense. He's sort of kind of trying to do that kind of bullying thing that he was doing to Luke Shaw to kind of kind of get, get a reaction out of him that isn't really working. Um, the comments after Pogba won the World Cup were really snidey, you know, when they asked him about um, uh, Paul Pogba's performance at the World Cup. Mourinho said something along the lines of, oh, it was a perfect condition for him to succeed. All he had to do was concentrate on football. Right, kind of insinuating that if he gives, if he's given too much time um, outside of football to kind of enjoy himself, to kind of relax, he kind of could take his eye off the ball and he can kind of get distracted. And when it comes to the game, he's not focused enough. So it's unnecessary to say that, even though it might be true. In the sense, why not just like toe the party line and say he had a good tournament? I hope, 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 I'm hope he can continue that form when he comes back for United. Instead, he had to kind of throw a little subliminal dig in it, which is kind of unnecessary. Um, he brought in Alexis Sanchez that kind of hasn't really worked out the way it's intended, like, um, which kind of upset Anti Martial. Anti Martial and Zatan um, Mourinho have a big beef because, which kind of stems back to when Zatan signed, right? Zatan signed and uh, Zatan took Martial's number. But it wasn't that big of a deal because Martial was still playing, right? But then when Martial didn't play, when Sanchez came in, it kind of brought, you know, it kind of made a bit of friction in the side. And Martial then had to, then suffered the ultimate omission because he wasn't then taken to the World Cup, right? Because of his lack of playing time with United. So there's loads of little subplots going on in the squad. And then you kind of see with the board, you know, uh, Mourinho and Ed Woodward obviously have a fractious relationship because um, at, in on every occasion Mourinho gets, he's always trying to make it known that he's given the board his list of players that he wanted and they did not fulfill his uh, wishes, right? Which is weird because, you know, the board did approve of Mourinho's contract extension just last season. So if you're going to give someone a contract extension by that very admission, you kind of, um, you're kind of saying that, yeah, we trust you, you're our guy. But if you know anything about football, you know that contracts don't mean jack shit. You can sign a, a contract for five years and just get sold the next summer after that. Football clubs are quite ruthless in that respect. So maybe that um, contract... Um, extension was not really a good thing you know what i mean maybe it was like a sign of the end was come soon coming so there's this weird little subplots happening um all over the club and you have uh, the glazers who are still hemorrhaging money out of the club who are still trying to get basically using it as an atm to pay off all their other debts so it's a very strange time to be a united fan plus the franchise side of united is kind of booming we've signed sponsorship deals with loads of other companies and brands and shit that's kind of generating loads of revenue around the club and it was super cash rich and a tour in asia and the us blah 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 but footballing wise it doesn't seem like we have a clue and then lately after the whole kind of conundrum of everyone realizing that maybe you might not have lost their, their identity and they don't really have a clue what they're doing um, in order to kind of make that protect a safe face, uh, Ed Woodward kind of leaked to the press that they were actively looking for a football director. Now the news has become now it's a sports director, but they're actively looking for somebody to kind of um, take us into a new age because most clubs, especially the bigger clubs in Europe, have that. Um, the reason being because most big clubs, if you're challenging for the big trophies, um, the success rate is very small, right? Because there's only so many of these trophies, right? The big leagues, there's only only one team can win the league, only one team can win the Champions League, right? Only one team can even win the Europa League. So it's not, the, the prizes are quite slim and the competition is vast. So because of that, the pressure is always high and managers get recycled quite quite often, right? No ma no, ma no, ma no, no, real ma no big manager in those big sides, maybe apart from Diego Sim Simeone, or even maybe to a certain extent, Max Allegri have actually stayed at their club for more than three years, right? Because they're kind of like if you don't if you don't succeed or if you don't win the Champions League or if you don't win top four, you kind of get booed out straight away. So because of that, you kind of have to have a bit of continuity in the way that you kind of want to recruit players in your kind of philosophy of how you want the club to play football in your style of play in your approach, whatever it is. You have to kind of have an overall overarching identity so that when you get another manager and you can just slot them into that, right? So that's why football directors, sports directors are kind of like so in vogue nowadays because they're the ones that are kind of going to carry on that continuity. They're going to make sure that it kind of is there by selecting managers who kind of make sense for the club, right? But if you look at my United managers, right, post-Fergie, you've got David Moyes, Louis van Gaal and Jose Mourinho. You couldn't get a more, especially after David Moyes, I think you've got Ryan Giggs, right, for a brief period, caretaker manager. So you couldn't get a more varied uh set of philosophies of football of how to play the game right how to approach things uh, in terms of how they conduct business and transfer market right uh, louis van gaal always opted for players who are hungry and ready to kind of like embrace his philosophy 100 percent right who are kind of a point to prove Mourinho kind of wants players 25 and upwards who've kind of have done things right so it's all very very different uh david moyes just wants to sign players he, he already bought in everton so it's all very different ways of approaching things so you need a football manager to kind of a football director or sports director to make sure that continuity evolves 
Uh, but Edward was kind of leaking it to the press, was obviously a, a kind of dig at Mourinho to kind of like get back at him and a jibe, and it kind of made Mourinho kind of out, kind of, out of place. And it's just a, a shitty situation to be in now, United manager, because United fan overall, because you don't know, you, you can't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. You don't know where it's going to come from because you get rid of Mourinho now, what happens? You have characters to caretaker manager. You still have that weird squad, right? Mismatch of a squad. You still have like um, a bit of dissent going on there. You still have players who kind of want out. Um, then you have the possibility of maybe finishing out of top four. It might not happen again because it's weird with United because as shit as we've been, I know everyone's saying that we've been shit and it's kind of evident we don't play attractive football. We're not kind of like the pub choice, right? No one's going to go out and kind of watch us play for the most part because you're not that entertaining unless you want to kind of see us lose, right? For that respect, for your team, if you're a supporter of another team. But with all that being said, we still finished second, right? I mean, was stressing that as well, but it's something that's always kind of puzzled me because I think happened, it happened a couple of times with uh, Ferguson too where we won the league without actually playing that well, right? We just kind of grinded out results, which is kind of what United has kind of been about. We have kind of won stuff the beautiful way sometimes, but we've also have been very functional and just kind of done things, right? So... I don't know how that happened. I don't know if not because Liverpool, even though they've added a lot of quality in their side now with Naby Keita uh, it, coming into their side, they've got Fabinho there. Um, they obviously got um, Virgil van Dijk in defence, who's been a real big hit. Allison and, and goalkeeper looks like someone that's going to be a world beater. So they've obviously improved their side, but Liverpool was still playing the same attractive football they were playing last season, right? It might have kind of intensified a bit more. Loose uh, Mo Salah's kind of had another season under his belt, but they they were they were they were still this good last season. So they didn't finish second, right? Tottenham was still quite good last season. They didn't finish second. Arsenal were Arsenal, and they didn't finish second. Chelsea, even though they kind of imploded. They're, they've still got really good players. They've got Eden Hazard in the team who can kind of win a game on his own. But they didn't finish second. But somehow we did, right? So there's obviously something that Mourinho can do. He's obviously got something, an ability to kind of uh, uh, organise a team to kind of nullify the other side or to kind of stop them playing in order to kind of help us, you know, to give us a chance to score, right? He's obviously got something that he can do. But it seems as if maybe it's kind of might have, it kind of might have run its course now. It's only two games in. This is kind of a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to it. But I'm, again, like I'm saying, I'm just kind of hypothesizing and thinking out loud. You sack him and then what? I don't necessarily think it's going to be as good, great. I don't think we're going to get revolutionary one. It's just going to be another reset of another three years. And unfortunately, I think for most United fans, we don't want to... Most United fans, if they're honest, don't really want to wait three years to get better again. We kind of want to instantly see an imp, instantly see a change and kind of go from there. And unfortunately, with the managers kind of being suggested now, now uh, you know, with like... Um, Leonardo Jardim, the manager at Seville. You've got Zidane that's being quoted around. But I can't see Zidane coming to United now, especially without a football director, especially without, especially in mid-season, he's not going to take that job. So from sure, most managers will come in at the end of, at the start, at the beginning of next season, right? So you have someone in, or maybe January, you have someone take us to January, probably a Carrick or someone, and then somebody else kind of take off the, take on the baton after, in the new year. But again, it's just, it's just a fuck up after fuck up. Um, I think, unfortunately, we're not gonna. It's not gonna happen. But I think, kind of similarly to what happened with England, it's less about the main person in the hot seat. It's more so about the overall club structure overall. It does think doesn't need a kind of root and stem analysis. We kind of do need to get rid of a lot of people that are in that in that kind of club overall, not footballing people, and kind of replace them people that actually care about the football. Because the business side of it, if Ed Woodward's doing a good job with the business and selling shirts and making sure we go on tour and stuff, that's cool. Let him stay in his business room. But the football side of it has to be managed by football people. We have to have people in it that can actually identify where we're going wrong and take us to a new era. Because a lot of fans have seen this day coming a lot long time ago. We knew this was going to happen post Fergie because post Fergie, and in the same case with maybe Arsenal Wenger, they were such colossus, right? Um, they were such. They were. They were kind of the all-encompassing manager who took care of everything. Like some, there's been some interviews that I've read of Arsene Wenger even kind of having an input on how the seating was arranged in the stadium. Do you know what I mean they were com they were very very hands-on? But nowadays, the the new era of football managers, um, they're kind of mostly coaches now, right? Where they have this way of playing that they can kind of want to implement to a team or into a squad. But the best best way they can do it is if all the other stuff is taken care of, so they can just concentrate on the football. That's how they're going to get the best results out of them. Um, they don't necessarily want to do, they don't necessarily want to be designing the stadium or picking the colour of the walls in the change room. They want to just be concentrating on what happens on the training pitch and what happens on the field on during match day, which is kind of what we need to get to as well. But we kind of have a manager who's really stubborn and stuck in his ways. And I guess for someone that's such a serial winner as Mourinho, he's done in his whole career, he's proved everyone wrong. 
So he kind of probably sees this as another opportunity to do that again, right? Everyone's kind of writing him off and saying that he can't do this, he can't do this, um, he can't do this, he can't do that. But he probably sees this as another opportunity for him to like kind of stick it up everyone's nose, right? And if he's able somehow to turn us around and win us a league, um, despite what everyone's saying, he's probably going to be one of his like kind of most satisfying um, glories or achievements ever in his, in his club, kind of like club history. Especially considering how poor we've been so far, how shit of a preseason we had, uh, how uh, weird of a transfer market we had, where we signed two players really earlier on, really early on in the window in the lot and Fred, and all of a sudden it went quiet everywhere else in every other position that we had when we knew when we knew straight away that we needed to get right back, we need to get a really good centre centre back, we needed another midfielder, we needed somebody up front, like we needed or a winger, sorry, we needed someone in the team, and we didn't get any of those positions unfortunately. So now we're in a position where. We're kind of looking around NBA, NBA, all the other Premier League clubs who have kind of got managers in who are trying new things or trying different approaches, and it's not the same. Even Leeds, for instance, they got Mark, they got um, Bielsa as manager, and two games in, you can see how diff, how kind of like amazing they look. The style of play, the short passing, the quick counter attacking, and we just don't have that. And that's the way main ad should have always played. And unfortunately, even the Mourinho style of play, which kind of people are only happy the Mourinho style of play if you're winning. Some fact of the matter, right? Even Sam Adas is a good example of it. Sam Adas was winning, right? He he finished, I think, eighth with Everton before he got sacked. So he had a good record, but even they couldn't stomach the, the Sam Adas way of playing football. They couldn't handle it. Even though he was grinding out results, they just couldn't they couldn't handle that style of play. So if you're a Marine and you're playing for, and you're a managing Man United and you're saying, Look, I the players aren't good enough that I've got now, but let me play this style of play in order for me to just get results. Cool, we're all right with that. We're gonna give you that, right? You can do that, no worries, no problem. But if you're not getting the results, you just, you have to go, because that style of play isn't sustainable. No one's gonna, no one looks good there. Like no one's gonna shine because you don't have the, the tools to make it work. Because he needs a good defenders, and he doesn't have them, right? Bay Bay is inconsistent and rash. Uh, Lindelof is obviously a dud, right? He's spent a lot of money on him, and he's someone that's like 23, 24, so he should be a little bit more assertive. He should look like he has something. You should see, be able to see something in him. It's not there. Phil Jones is flat to deceive, and Smalling is one of the worst defenders we've ever had in, his, in our history. So bad that he, he wasn't even taken to the World Cup, right? And this is considering, like, you know, he plays for Man United. Man United centre-back should go to the World Cup, and he didn't go. That says a lot about how poor he is, right? Compared to all the other centre backs that England have. So again, it's a weird situation to be in. I'm pretty sure Mourinho probably won't be there by the end of next by the end of this season. I'm pretty sure either he'll walk or he'll get sacked or something will happen, a blow up because it's, you know I don't I can't remember the last time a club had picked a uh, a manager or a player. I don't think it's gonna happen. Even though the reports, if you might have seen it, that there's reports Pogba uh, is maybe kind of like you know. Not not kind of being as professional as he should be outside of football. Uh, there's there's videos and pictures of him doing balloons, but which I'm not that bothered about because I think it's post World Cup victory, so he's doing balloons in some sort of mansion somewhere. Um, he obviously is going out with this Colombian girl who's got a video, viral video that went around the internet of her doing bums with coke. So everyone's kind of putting two and two together and saying that you know if if she does drugs and he obviously does drugs by proxy, which I'm not really sold on to be honest. And I don't really care to be honest. If I'm completely blunt, I don't really care. I just want my players to perform on match day. I don't care what you do outside of football, as long as you can deliver on the pitch. It's blessed with me. But if your actions on the pitch are showing that you don't not don't care, but you you're not actually fulfilling your potential, and you're playing against Brighton. You have two. That's the thing about Pogba. It's kind of a bit frustrating. He was playing alongside what Andres Pereira and Fred, who are kind of protecting him, right? So he can just sit there and just pivot and throw the ball around left, right, and center. And he's still not able to do that. Still not able to dominate a game, which just goes to show, like you know, he has a lot, a lot, long way to go in that regard. But again, that might be due to the manager. It might be due to kind of him just having such conflict with the manager that he just can't get to, he can't play the way he wants to play because he's still thinking about this manager who he kind of secretly hates we don't know what's happening but it's gonna be a long season for united fans i think you should we should all just like strap in back on tight and hope that we kind of battle through this period it's probably not gonna happen we're probably gonna suffer again as as we should do because other clubs have kind of moved forward and we haven't but if we do then i'll be more than happy with that happening Anyway, um, next topic on the subject because I blabbered on about football. See, that's why I don't talk about football because it takes up too much time and end up getting fucking annoyed with everything else. So, anyway, um, of course, um, we're going to talk a little bit about forward again. I know it's annoying. So, if you've heard this before, then please skip ahead. But I'm going to talk about forward again because Resident Advisor put up a little review of forward, uh, the 24-hour nightclub in London that I went to over the weekend. 
I had an amazing time. I fucking enjoyed it. Um, I can't wait to go back again. I'm probably not going to go back anytime soon. Maybe because I'm, I'm due to go to Berlin next month, end of uh, the end of September. I'm going to Berlin, so I'm kind of trying to save a bit of money for that. Um, so it might be October the next time I go, but, you know, these things usually change. I'll probably get excited again and get hyped up and go again. The review on Resident Advisor was really good and really kind of pointed out a lot of the things that I was kind of talking and thinking about as well, but I thought... Um, I kind of wanted to speak about a lot, a kind of a few topics that were pointed out in the article. I'll kind of get up here on the screen so you guys can see. If you guys, if you're not watching this on YouTube and we listen to via the audio podcast, I'll obviously link this article in the show notes. But it's a resident advisor review of the opening of Fold in London. So I'm going to click on it now. Hopefully you guys see it on the screen now. Da -da -da -da. Oops, and put my microphone back in here. Okay. Yeah, this microphone dropped out of the arch again. So annoying. All right. So clipped it back in there. Done. So, um, fold opening in London. Um, an article on Resident Advisor, a review written by who's written it by by Sam Davis. So check it out. So is this new twenty four hour club the venue that Capital has been crying out for? An article on Resident Advisor. What Londoners want is what other club uh, global cities seem to be in, have in space. The feeling of raving freely in a professional nightclub. In addition to a number of venues closures um, and Hackney's regressive, retrogressive uh, licensing policy, the city's problems extended to commercially successful venues that leave dancers feeling disillusioned by paying over the odds for a largely soulless experience. Illicit rave culture maintains a ghostly presence, but it can never offer the safety and comfort of a properly equipped space, which is, a, which is kind of you know, that's a good point to kind of like um, stop on and kind of pause a little bit. This That's a good point that I've been kind of saying a lot about, right? Like, we do have some good clubs around. We do have some good venues. But for the most part, you do have to pay over the odds. Um, you can't exactly turn up and get a ticket. You do have to, even if you do turn to get a ticket, you're going to pay over the odds, right? The kind of like E1, the LWE, the print works, those kind of places are charging a, a lot of money for you to see DJs. A lot, some of them do kind of get in high caliber acts and the space is actually super amazing and stuff. So you're having to have to cover those kind of costs, whatever it may be. But for the most part, it's just too much money for raving, especially if you've been to actual um, cities in Europe that are geared towards clubbing, such as Amsterdam and Berlin. You can go see some of the best DJs that you want for less than 20 euros, right? And these are in some of the best clubs uh, in the world. So the fact that London has um, a problem with nightlife in general because clubs are closing down, but it also has these spaces that charge over the others is a little bit annoying. And the article continues. Um, Seb Glover and Lasha Giorgiliani, Giorgiliani co-founders of East London's new 24-hour fall club, know this only too well. They said, we wanted to capture that freedom of expression that you get in places like Berlin, Amsterdam, Glover told me. Both also mentioned clubs in Tbilisi and Tokyo and Nigeria's Africa Shrine wants a spiritual home of fellow Kuti's inspiration, which is actually amazing to hear. Once Fall's first dance was in full swing on Saturday, it was impossible to escape the feeling of having somewhere slipped outside of London. Of Sam, I slipped outside of London. The party began at midday with DJs from the range of club local nights. Revive her dimension and the global roots, playing all afternoon. Though the head count barely reached double figures until nightfall. At that point, an infectious atmosphere descended, mixing giggly excitement with uh, liberating abandon, a feeling London has, has long overdue. Which is interesting to hear. So it was quite empty in the beginning, but got full towards the end. Um, well, in the afternoon, it was quite um, empty, which makes more sense because it, it had to be a real nutcase to turn up at fold at 12 p.m. in the afternoon. But I guess, you know, if you're about that life, you're about that life. Um, diversity, surely London's greatest quality was affected in the fold crowd. The later it got, the more skin became visible. The club's locker system allowed ravers to change into the type of outfits that would stand out on the tube. This, coupled with the photo ban, meant people were free to really let loose. Which is interesting, because I didn't, I didn't think of it that way, clubbers. I, usually, um, ravers uh, that I've known, or people that I've seen whenever I go out, they usually wear the kind of like, you know, the whole part of it is the kind of the, the shock factor of going on the tube and wearing a, a gag what do you call it, a ball gag and the whole, I mean, the whole holster and straps and shit. That's the whole shock effect of like actually traveling on a tube with it and going into club. I guess some people just want to cover up or, you know, avoid any hassle from uh, lads and shit on the street and just go into a club. Um, the local system, like I mentioned previously, is absolute, such a great idea. Uh, it's maybe a little bit overcharged in, in terms of the pricing wise. I think it's like, I think they said it was seven pound for the lock and 10 pound deposit, right? Overall. So you end up getting, what, three quid back or something? I don't know how that works out. My maths is fucking shocking. But it might be a little bit over um, over the top. But again, maybe just to make sure people give back their locks and whatever so they can get the money back and the keys and stuff. But overall, the lockers is such a great idea. 
especially considering that most clubs that I've been to or most places, especially because I've been pickpocketed a couple of times when I've been to a few of those kind of like um, secret venue warehouse parties, right? Um, so it's nice to kind of go somewhere where you can kind of stash your stuff and not feel like you've got, you're going to be in danger of losing anything. And it continues. Uh, Glover and Giorgio Lani have waxed lyrical over the club's state-of-the-art lighting, sound, and sound, both of which were superb in the night. The space itself is simple and intimate. Clubbers enter through a door courtyard before climbing the stairs to the dance floor. There's one floor big enough for a few hundred people, which was a buzz from midnight onwards, uh, though never overcrowded. There are plans to open a second room downstairs, which is fucking awesome. It's flanked on one side by a bar, which was great, really easy to get to. Um, the bartenders were super cool, really quick um, with just getting you your drinks and just really friendly overall. And then to, and then the door to the outside terrace was really nice too. You kind of get a view of um, all the kind of factories and the trains um, outside of the, of the warehouse, really industrial kind of feel. The courtyard is a welcoming entrance, but the terrace's easy access made it a popular spot, especially in the earliest morning sunlight. Even at its best, the biz, the club, was easy to navigate. The security Glover told me had been handpicked from years of working in events, which was nice because they were all chill. Uh, I didn't hear of anyone being turned away, but the door policy is meant to be more stringent than at, that at most other night London clubs with bouncers instructed to make decisions based on conversations with punters. Each member of staff I encountered was friendly and helpful. A startling 21 names were crammed onto the lineup, making some slots feel like teasers. If a few ravers were uncomfortable with the rapid switches, though the intention was to showcase the ample talents available to the bookers. Many people have come away with new discoveries. My pick was ear to the ground Gareth Wilde, who played an hour of transcendent techno at, at around 3 a.m. Elsewhere, there was a few inappropriate moments, including what sounded like a bling era hip hop cut. But my lasting memories are gorgeous stretches of trance around sunrise, G dance, which is one of my favorites too, that I heard, and the zippy snatches of hardcore that I followed us soon after with Body Hammer. Yeah, Body Hammer was awesome. Um, hearing hardcore for two, one hour was fucking great. On a night so filled with promise, I felt obliged to look to TV problems, but there was none to notable of notable impact. Toilet queues were constant and the bar's free water supply did run out once or twice the certain members of the crowd perhaps from 6 a.m influx of walk-ins were reminders that it's still uh, pushy in london but that's standing that's what you're gonna get in london but overall everyone was smiling and chat was flying between different friend groups it's hard not to get carried away with false potential there's already talk of a bassanini showcase and an in-house label we're not here to try and save london's nightlife in any way said glover so far uh, thanks for, to, a, to a night nobody will forget in a hurry we've been given a taste of what's possible they're not here to save london's nightlife but they're gonna they, they're fucking going to they, there's no doubt they're going to this approach right again i'm just i think i've mentioned it in a few of my videos you know i'm kind of petitioning myself to be the next uh london nightlife mayor so vote for me when the votes come out again um but this approach right i'm not sure who's impossible for it i'm not sure if the if the hackney i mean sorry if the um, newham council got involved in it but this is what you need right this is what you need if you're a council and you're looking for a little bit more of income to come in or you're looking for a kind town to become a little bit more of a hub to kind of like attract younger people to come in and uh take out leases and rent homes and shit and give back into the economy buy in, buy into shops and whatever open up bars and cafes around the area this is what you need to give them you need to give them something right and i always had the my kind of idea even before i heard about this club which was kind of really eerie was kind of a copy on what amsterdam are doing amsterdam have given i think 10 clubs a 24-hour license a 24-hour license um is kind of uh i forgot what the term is but they kind of um it's, it's an agreement with the council when you get a 24-hour license that you're going to be extra stringent and extra careful to make sure that your punters and people around the club are safe and you're going to make sure you look after the space in general. So it's a kind of agreement that we're going to give you a 24-hour license, but you have to be extra, extra careful with everyone that kind of comes in here. So you have to have a really strict door policy. You have to make sure you have all the right safety um, uh, procedures involved in the club. Um, water all that sort of shit make sure you have safe spaces people that are patrolling the arena blah blah, blah whatever it may be to make sure nothing shit happens in there because if it does a license gets revoked but the thing that was actually a real genius uh move on Amsterdam's part was well, most of these clubs are on the outside perimeter of the main city center so they're not near most of the residential housings right so they're kind of away from all the places that people would complain about the noise and if they are and even if they are next to residential places because they've been given a 24-hour license, the council works in tandem with the venue to ensure that they have all the right um, sound insulation to make sure that no one on the outside is affected. And honestly, right, when I walked up to the uh, fold, I was right in front of it. Like, I was folding up my jacket, putting it into my little um, pout, into my little um, side bag, and I couldn't hear, I could just hear faintly the music, faintly. 
and it was loud as fuck in there, right? I couldn't hear it outside at all, nothing. You just hear people talking, nothing you could hear outside. So they've obviously done a good job of like, making sure the sound is perfect and make sure they've insulated the building completely because it's an old factory building, so it obviously had to be completely gutted and completely real done. So it, it did take a long time to get sorted, but they've done it and they've got it done. I'm sure somebody kind of did in tandem with the council themselves. So it's something that has kind of puzzled me in, a lot, in most part because I think the the argument for having warehouse places and clubs in general in kind of built up places like Dawson and Hackney has kind of run its course. I think everyone can kind of agree that that is going to happen, right? There's too much friction. There's too much a clashing of our heads when it comes to the hipsters in Dawson and Hackney and the hipsters when it comes and the people that live in, actual, in those actual areas, right? And we kind of see, we kind of saw how the residents in Stoke New and kind of won that battle for the most part, right? And kind of got rid of the clubs and sure, it's just kind of another good example too where most of the clubs are kind of closing at two or maybe one for the most part, even on the weekends. But all we ask is that for the people that do want to go out and have a good time, just give us a spot that we can go to. Give us a spot that we can go to where we know for sure we can stay out until ungodly uh, amounts of hours. And if 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 you can, try and not make it too far. Right? We've got the cores in Tottenham. We've got now, we've got this um, fold venue in Canning Town. If they open up another one in South for everyone that lives in South, because there's a few people that I met at Fold who came came up from Peckham and, you know, coming up to coming up to, from Peckham to... Coming from Peckham to Canning Town can be a bit annoying. It's a bit far. You kind of have to go back into centre and then come back a bit down to go. It's a bit of a, a ball to get back to South London. But if they open up a space somewhere in South London that people could go to as well, that's similar to the fold, that is what you need, right? That's the kind of next evolution. And you have one in West, you have one in North. So that what, what eventually will happen is that you'll take the strain away from all the built up places in kind of like even in terms of Peckham, New Cross, Dalston, Shoreditch, Hackney. Um, you, you, you kind of... Um, all that pressure that's on those clubs to kind of like, you know, for people going there and the promoters and stuff will kind of be alleviated because you have these places that people can actually go to and get fucked up. And then you kind of, the council kind of get its wish because then you have these bars and nightclubs and that quote unquote nightclubs that will kind of be open until two, but won't have that much of a rowdy clientele in there because all the rowdy heads will kind of go to 24 hour clubs and the 24 hour clubs will make sure the rowdy heads behave because if they don't, they'll lose their license. So everyone kind of wins, right? It's a kind of weird agreement. Oh, whistling, Jesus Christ. Hopefully you can't hear that. So it's an agreement that everyone kind of has. Living in this area is horrible. So it's an agreement that everyone kind of has that, it, and it works for everybody in unison. And I'm hoping that Fold um, is kind of an experiment that can kind of prove that these spaces can work if they're done like this, right? If they're placed, if they're put in an area where people can go and let loose, right? I was in there. I saw people actually dressing up. People having a good time laughing do you know what i mean just dancing the absolute heads off like sweating buckets like i did just having an absolute blast right because they knew they were going to be out for as long as they wanted to they can go they can go home right at the, right when the thing ended now I, I left exactly when it ended at 12 so you can have the best time as you want and then for the people that i just want to go out and just you know have a drink after work but also want to maybe have a bit of dance you've got those bars and and kind of clubs that you've got in Dawson or whatever they may be, they can go and have a good time in. And everyone can, and it kind of suits everyone in unison because those bars and clubs will end at two or one, and these things out of the sticks away from everybody else will end at six or twelve in the morning, which is perfect for everyone that um, that lives in those areas and everyone that kind of is attending. So I think hopefully this is a good experiment. Again, like I mentioned previously, I'm hoping that everyone that attended and is going to attend in the future kind of takes it upon themselves. Because I think again, it's a personal responsibility thing. It's that whole adage about. If you if you sweep your own like front lawn, right, and your neighbor sees you sweeping your own front lawn, he'll then get inspiration to sweep his and then in unison the whole community be clean, right? So it's the idea of like you sweep yours first and then everyone else will kind of follow suit. So I think if we all take personal responsibility, we all take um um, ownership of this space and say look fold is our nightclub right fold is a place that we want to go to and have a good time and we want to let loose in if we all take care of each other we will make sure everyone's safe we don't make sure everyone's being a dickhead no one's kind of being too touchy no one's kind of interrupting someone's space or being annoying and shit and we call people out we make sure no one's doing anything stupid on the dance floor right that's going to make sure that everyone's safe and nothing dumb stuff, nothing happens. Good. We don't want anything stupid happening for some police investigation to take place or council to review the license to kind of like revoke stuff and take off and kind of limit the time. No one wants that. We want to just make sure that it's legit and it's safe. The, obviously, the owners and the venue staff are going to do part of their job, but it's also up to us attendees to make sure that we do our job too to make sure that place succeeds. Because um, as cliche as it, as it might seem, the community is basically the most important part of that club or all clubs in general right um whether it's a restaurant 
whether it's a bar, whether it's a theatre, the people that actually come to your your place, um, your establishment on a regular basis who kind of are going to spread the word, who are going to tell their friends, like I have been talking to Rabbit on about it all week. They're the ones that are going to be, uh, the ones that are going to kind of hold you down. They're going to ensure that your place kind of succeeds or fails in the, in the in the other case, right? You, I'm sure we've all been to places or clubs that have kind of flopped because they, they were welcoming of the wrong people inside the spaces, right? So, so it can be annoying. There might be occasions where you'll go to fold or you might get turned away. Um, but don't take it personally, right? Just just look at it in the long run. You eventually will get in there. There's loads of nights. They're going to be putting on a night every weekend, I'm sure, uh, once they kind of get iron out the kind of uh, the kinks and the kooks or the kind of errors in the first place. There'll be a night they'll be putting on every single weekend. So don't take it too personally. Just look at the kind of the long picture, the long image or what's going to happen in the future and, and know that overall we finally got a club that we can kind of go to and rave for 24 hours. So I thought that... Uh, review was really cool i'm gonna link it into my show notes below so you guys can check it out but yeah fold is opening has, op has opened and we finally have a 24 hour space and we can kind of let loose and get crunked in i'm absolutely over the moon what's next um ariana huffington criticized elon musk for of tesla for working conditions and people don't sleep or go home so this is an interesting article right um so this kind of uh, transpired over the last, I think over the last few hours on Twitter and social media and stuff. Um, Ariane Huffington posted this article um, that she wrote, like an open letter to Elon Musk, kind of like imploring him to kind of rest and take it easy and not be too hard on herself, on, on, too hard on himself, right? And Ariane Huffington, if you're not familiar, is obviously the, the founder of the Huffington Post. Um, and she's kind of leaped back into the zeitgeist because she published this book on the uh, benefits of sleeping, right? Which kind of was met with a bit of cynicism from the general public because, you know, she's a billionaire and she's now preaching to people that they should sleep more in order to kind of be successful in life. And everyone's kind of, you know, the instant retort to someone like Arian Huffington is like, oh, it's easy for you to say you can sleep because you've got, you know, more money than God, right? But I get the kind of premise what she's kind of saying because I think there was a guy on Joe Rogan podcast recently who kind of... Um, spoke about the actual science of sleep right making so the idea that some people say that they can sleep for four hours and still perform at the highest level isn't true for the most part most people do need seven to eight hours of sleep right but there are of course because you know they, we have genetic freaks we have people that have just come out of the womb and are ripped to fuck right they don't do any sort of workout they eat what the fuck they want and they just look jacked that's just a, that's just a fact you know people like that right so that's something that's just like in part of your genes. So there are people out there who are able to survive with four hours of sleep. But there was a period of time, unfortunately, I think Virgil was part of it. Um, maybe not Elon Musk. There's a few other people who were part of it who were kind of like um, promoting this idea that the fact that the, the, the reason why they were able to do so many projects on the go was that they, was, they were kind of uh, sacrificing sleep in order to kind of create more. So they were making sure they were only sleeping as minimal time as they needed to and just creating again and again and again. And that was why they were making that was why they were making so many leaps and bounds in their career. But it was a little bit uh, disingenuous because it, it's not something everyone can do. Right. And it isn't really part of it isn't really the main reason why they're succeeding. They're succeeding because they're able to do many like a Virgil's good example. He's able to juggle many things at the same time. And he seems as if like he kind of. Um, he kind of gets energy. He kind of gets more inspiration. He kind of gets more ideas, uh, more creativity. He's able to deliver at a higher level when he has more things going. The more places he's spinning, the better he seems to be able to do. Um, and I'm sure the moment, the, I'm sure we will see the moment he starts to like take it easy and take a back seat, we'll start seeing his work, uh, the level of his work kind of like get worse or not get as or not be as good as it was previously. Because I think now he's kind of reached that kind of like zeitgeist moment because he's been able to do so many things at the same time. Some of them, some people could argue weren't that good, but that doesn't matter. The fact that he's able to do so many things at a high level and, and kind of consistently deliver, because I've seen people on social media, on Twitter, it's, you know, there's weird kind of movement of people, graphic designers on social media who kind of share um, images of t-shirts they want to design, but they haven't ne never released them, right? So he's, he doesn't do that. He kind of like doesn't really show off uh, PSD files and stuff like that, right? He's kind of actually making the clothes, right? Putting them out, there, even if it's marking them up with a, with a marker pen, which is something that's really commendable and kind of goes back to the whole, like harking back to the whole kind of DIY punk spirit of just like doing the best you can with whatever means you have around you. Um, so people like a Virgil, people like an Elon Musk are able to do many things, operate on a high level at the same time and get not many bits of sleep. But there's also the part of it that are enough to misses the point in the letter. She's kind of like telling Elon to kind of chill, chill out. Is that Elon Musk has kind of been in the eye, in the bullseye of the media, of the public in general for a long, long time, right? Ever since Tesla kind of got founded and or ever since kind of SpaceX, really. 
because things have never kind of panned out the way he wanted it to, right? Um, he had a couple failed launches with SpaceX. Um, some of the production on the Tesla never met the deadline, especially some of the, I think apart from maybe the last few, they never actually were delivered on time. There was always delays. And people are always like saying that maybe he promised the world, but it was never actually able to deliver. So now he's in this period of time where he can't afford to not deliver anymore and he's having to sleep in the factory the stories of sleeping in the factory he actually uh, did a video with the uh, i think it was msnbc where he kind of showed them where he's actually sleeping in the boardroom he kind of just let a mattress on the floor with a pillow and he's just sleeping in the boardroom there just to kind of make sure that he's on top of everything that's happening in the factory so he's at he's at a really crucial time period of his time where he's having to down tools and really really go for it and he can't afford to sleep and i think he kind of said that in his kind of um response to Arian Havitton, which I'll try and get up here on social media. Uh, let me see if I can get it up here. Uh, uh, where is it? Oh, Anyway, she tweeted something. Um, I'm sure she, I'll see. Hold on. Let me actually get it up. Arian Havitton tweeted it, and then um, have, he actually responded, which was quite interesting, his response. But it's just funny to me, um, the reaction that some people have with high achievers. It's a weird thing, like, or people that are actually operating on a high level. It seems as if like, and maybe I've, maybe because it's so otherworldly, maybe because it's such a, it's something that we can't really comprehend as average people, right? As normal kind of like regular folk who are not necessarily um, trying to extend human life on, you know, and try and make humans multi-planetary species or trying to create, you know, an electronic car manufacturing mega empire and stuff, right? For us normal folk, it kind of seems a bit weird, right? We just can't wrap our head around it. So some people are kind of, you know, they have that little chill out, take it easy. It's sort of the same thing when you kind of start losing weight, right? There's a weird reaction when people start losing weight or kind of getting fit where some people kind of get a bit put off by it and start telling you that you're getting too skinny as a weird kind of like backhanded compliment. And usually... I would get annoyed by that kind of thing, but because I'm try, because I try and be as introspective as I can, I always try and have the perspective. As some most people when they say that, it's usually coming from a point of pain in their life as opposed to what anything I'm doing wrong. And I and I've come away with it thinking that mostly it has to do with the idea that you know it's a kind of you are re living you are a living representation of something that they're unable to do, right? Because they know you, so they they've able they've, they've seen you go from fat to fit. Or from like uh, I don't know, like skinny to ripped, right? And they've no, they've they, they know you. They've seen how you were before, and it just kind of like it um, upsets them to know that someone in their life who's around them, who could, they can touch and feel, who's not a celebrity, who's not someone on social media, has been able to kind of change their life, like having to change something of their life to just like through commitment and hard work. No special, no cheats, no uh, weird hack, no bio thing, no kind of voodoo, just through hard work. And it's kind of a reminder of just how much of a failure in some respects they are, have been in their life or how disappointing they've been or um, how disappointed they are in themselves through their um, lack of self-discipline. That's what I think it kind of comes down to. But it's weird because this isn't like a commoner talking to Elon Musk. This is somebody, uh, another high achiever in Harry and Huffington who's, you know, a very successful entrepreneur in her own right, who's unable to see, who's unable to relate um, to what it must be what it must feel like to be elon musk right having to deliver on tight deadlines having investors on your back um having a stock market um having a bullseye for you kind of shorting your stock on tesla like it's constant battle he's having to fight right? it's like a whack-a-mole everything he's trying to every time he whacks one something else pops up do you know what i mean like there's always kind of problems coming again and again and again so you'd you'd imagine someone like Arian Huffington would have more sympathy with elon musk because she's been in the she's in the same arena they operate in the same sort of sport but it seems as if, like, you know, we as humans in general, regardless of our station, can get on our higher horse and feel like, you know, we have a right or in a position to kind of criticize others when we've kind of maybe done the same thing in our in our own kind of way. But I'll read a tweet that to you. So you can see what she said. Um, so here it is. I'll kind of get up on the screen now. Show it. So I think Kelly Clarkson kind of stuck her oar in as well. But this is the original tweet. I'll say it here. So the Swiss is the following. Uh, Dear Elon, please uh, have you say other thing. Uh, Elon, uh, Aaron Hoverton writes, Dear Elon, please change the way you work to be more in line with the science around how humans are most effective. You need it. Tesla needs it and the world needs it. So I guess it's well intentioned, right? She's kind of telling him, look, kind of if you if you rest and take it easy or actually rest the time that you're meant to rest for, you can actually perform better. 
and it's going to best serve you, the company, and the world overall. Cool, no problem. But then Elon Musk replied straight away in the comment on evil, which is quite funny. He says, Ford and Tesla are the only two American car companies to avoid bankruptcy. I just got home from the factory. You think this is an option? It is not. And I think this was posted at like 2 a.m. something, like 2 and 2 a.m. in the after 2 a.m. Saturday morning. So obviously he's kind of been working around the clock. And then the interesting part of it, right? The interesting part of this whole story is that one of Elon Musk, one of uh, Tesla's uh, factory workers, kind of also kind of butted in and stuck his oar in and kind of gave his um, actual take on the whole idea of working 24 hours around the clock and what it and kind of the pressure around having to deliver. Um, with Tesla and make sure that it is a success and this is a quite interesting perspective into what it takes to kind of achieve excellence right what it takes to actually achieve to go for something that is going to actually change the world not to actually you know not to make silly games or to say something that you know is going to be forgotten in a couple of years but to actually make a mark in this world this is what it actually requires and I think again it's a reminder for everyone out there who has heady dreams or kind of wants to do things and thinks that they're better than they thinks that they should be somewhere else that so they shouldn't so it thinks that they're better than where they should be um has aspirations of being legendary wherever it may be this is what it requires this is from someone that works there right so this is a guy called peter villa posted on twitter this following thread which i thought was very very interesting um and it follows here peter villa says to ariana huffington following on from Elon Musk's tweet ariana if i've learned anything these last few years launching model x being in a production and now being in service as model three is landing it is that um, in order to advance the world to sustainable energy, our behavior isn't r irrational. It's almost an operational requirement, which is an, a really interesting part there, right? In order to advance the world to sustainable energy, our behavior isn't irrational. It is almost an operational requirement. In order to change this world to kind of like, you know, steer in the direction of sustainable energy, they have to adopt a behavioral system that is irrational by everyone else's measure but is operational requirement by the nature of the business and that's kind of uh the whole adage behind of um what is it uh if you want to change the world you can't do the same thing everyone else is doing kind of something along that kind of lines right and the the thread continues uh what does he say where's the continue of the thread one what was posting about here let me see where he posted the whole entire thread I'm going to account because I want to read the whole entire thing. I think the whole entire thing was really, 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 really important to read. Come on, where is it? Where, is, where did he post it? Where did he post it? Hold on, let me see if I can get up here. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, there we go. So maybe this one, right? So I can scroll down and just read the thread. Is it the whole thread? How do you show the thread without everyone else's fucking all getting stuck in? Anyway, it reads as following. Um, one, two. Okay, cool. So let me just read it from his screen because this is getting, being annoying. I'll just read it from here. Get up there. Go down here. That's six. That's one. Okay, there's two there. So the second tweet reads as following. Um, I understand very clearly what you mean about human performance about sleep. I'm an ex-army ranger. Yes, fight or flight symptoms kick in and also I understand how hard it is when my family stayed in Texas and I moved to California without them. Um, to see what I could build for us with this new company called Tesla. I only saw my family one weekend a month for two years. Let that, let, let that sink in a bit. This Tesla engineer stayed in the factory, right? Working on Tesla and only saw his weekend one, he only saw his family one weekend a month for two years. As, as I worked incredibly hard to launch Model X, quite possibly the hardest car to build, but I understand that every single car was a difference. Uh, we, are, we as Tesla leaders have a sense of responsibility to our people and uh, moreover to the planet, more even to the children of the future. Of all the groups and teams I've, been, I've had the privilege of leading, Tesla employees are the hardest and most rewarding to lead. Uh, because they're risking so much on the hopes that someone else's vision changes so that we maybe have a better, have a chance for a future. Uh, being a leader in this company requires an almost special forces mindset. We're not tired. You feed your team first. When you're hungry, you hand them a pillow first. When you're falling behind, you give your team a hand and accomplish the mission. Like, you know, it's kind of the whole adage of like, you know, great leaders, great, great leaders eat last. I've been in uh, arduous war conditions, have started many businesses and survived cancer. I'm grateful my experience has equipped me to be a leader in the most difficult environment the planet has ever faced. The revolution 
that barely any person, the revolution that any any person or any other car manufacturer wants to be part of. The electric vehicle revolution that Tesla is spearheading. I'm grateful to have a leader in this fight that is willing to sacrifice like like his people and for his people. So that's another adage too. You have to imagine like, you know, sometimes you have an interview, right? I'm going to quickly take this off the screen and just talk to the camera. Um, you know, sometimes when you have an interview, you know, sometimes when you go to interviews, and you're interviewing with somebody and especially with a CEO or founder of a company and they have that annoying habit of like um, asking you questions and making you uh, ask, making you answer questions in the hope that you are going to demonstrate the same level of passion that they have for their own business, right? And it's always something that's been a bit of a bugbear of me with kind of people that employ people in for general, right? They somehow are looking for people to be as passionate as they are about their own product, as they are about it. I mean, it's never going to happen. Some people have different reasons for being at work. Some people just want to, you know, have another notch in their career. Some people are looking for the exposure. Some people just want to make money in order to kind of keep a roof over their heads, right? Everyone's got different motivations. But if you want to lead a team, right, you have to lead them through just the, the example that you show um, because it's your thing, right? And those in the company who kind of want to also be leaders, who also want to do their own thing, who kind of are passionate about the company, will see your example and just follow suit. But you need to show an example. You need to show something. You can't just be like prodding people or making people do things in the hope that they're going to show the passion that they show the passion that you have. It's your thing. It's your baby. So Elon Musk needs to deliver on these deadlines, needs to make sure Tesla is a profitable company. And he is foregoing himself in the hopes that this company will succeed. And in effect, the people around him who also wanted the company to succeed are, so, are, seeing, are seeing him and be like, oh, shit, if my leader's doing that, then I also need to do this. Do you know what I mean? So they're kind of just following suit by their very nature. They've kind of, you know, um, adopted that mindset Elon Musk had without even thinking about it because they also want to change the world. And that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs or business owners don't really understand. They kind of just, what they kind of have this false idea that they kind of are going to hire people that are going to be as passionate as they are when it's their business but they also are not leading in the right way that's going to show people in the company that this is how you should be working this is a level that we're expecting you to work at right it's a very strange um conundrum anyway let's continue with this because i thought it was very very interesting uh it continues um da -da -da -da. So as so as you're willing, so as you're writing a letter to Elon for his exhaustive work, please also write a letter to every military general because all Elon is doing is being a leader, steering the ship in the best direction possible with the time that he has, and that means team no sleep. I love that man. I absolutely love that. Absolutely love that. And I think um again, I understand Arian Huffington's sentiment. I get that she's trying to be a helpful and she's trying to like you know um, she, you know she knows Elon Musk and she's trying to make sure that he's not burning himself out because he had an interview with the um, New York Times. I'm going to link to in the article where he kind of said he's been probably one of the hardest weeks of his life. He mentioned a story where he was kind of the best man for his brother's wedding and he had to kind of like fly. He had to, he stayed overnight in the factory, flew out private jet to the wedding, stayed there for a couple of hours and flew back again to LA, which is, you know, which is insane basically. I'm, wh wherever the factories are based, I'm not sure it's LA. So, he suffers obviously like an incredible um, schedule, but for the most part, the reviews of the Model 3 have been amazing on the internet. So people that have them, that have had their cars delivered are raving about them. Um, they've obviously reached, they're obviously trying to maybe take the company private. There's loads of things happening in the background. You know, SpaceX has finally launched the Falcon Heavy. That's been a success. So loads of moving pieces are happening around him. And he has to, he just has to do this. This is one of those things you have to do. You have to just sacrifice the time and just do it. Because I remember there's a lot of people in streetwear, even I did it uh, back in the day, that you just like, you know, disappear for a while and then come back with the brand, right? You have to kind of just like lock yourself away, work ir um, an irrational amount of hours in order to kind of get the thing that you need to get, to kind of to squeeze much time into to squeeze out of, out of life. And I kind of do the same thing in my own respects, right? Um, I work full time and I have, and I want to do this podcast because, you know, it's just fun to do. And I just have to do things during the time that most people wouldn't want to do stuff, right? You kind of, when you wake up before work, you don't necessarily want to turn on the camera and record shit or write a blog or do a mix, but I'm doing it because this is the only time that I have to do it and I also want to squeeze, much time, squeeze as much as I can at the time I have available, right? That's just part and parcel of it in the hope that once I finally get to the station that I want to get to, that time will free up, but you know it won't, right? Because it's not naturally, when it's something that you love to do, you're just going to commit more time than you have available to it. So I just think it's one of those kind of cases of like, let the let the let those exceptional let the exceptional people that, that are amongst us be exceptional 
and let's just use it as an example right as a as a barometer as a benchmark of like okay that's what it takes to be successful like that's it point blank like Elon Musk doesn't sleep he doesn't see his family people that work in his company see their family once a month right one week in a month it's insane right they all sleep in the factory or they sleep in hotels near the area right they're committed to making sure his company is a, is a, is, a, is a success so this is just what it takes to be successful. It is what it is. So if you come in half-hearted or if you come in thinking that you can go... It's what Gary Vaynerchuk says, right? About people going and watch... People saying they have aspirations of building a billion-dollar company, but they're watching House of Cards, right? They're finishing entire seasons of Breaking Bad, right? You just can't do that, unfortunately. It's just not possible. You can't do both things at once. And, I've, and I know that personally. Like, it's just impossible to do. Like, I've missed... I've not watched many shows or especially the ones that everyone's watched the full season through just because there's not enough time. Like I come back from work, I have to organize a, I have to organize a playlist. I've got to sort out bookings. I've got to write this. I've got to record a podcast. I've got to do a mix. Like there's so many things you have to got to do consistently, especially if I start my own brand or I start taking the photography more seriously. There's so many things that have to be done in the time they have available that you don't have the time to do all those large kind of like luck, um, those kind of um, extracurricular kind of just like you know Netflix and chill activities. You don't you just don't have the time to do it. So I think. A lesson to be learned from everyone. Let the exceptional people be exceptional. And let's use it as an example, you know, of this is what it takes to be successful. This is what you need to do. Um, if you don't want to do it, then cool. But there may, be, there may be a level underneath this that you can do that can, you can still achieve a higher level. But I think if you want to be, and if you have delusions of grandeur of being an Elon Musk, are you, are you willing to forego your family? Are you willing to maybe nearly miss your brother's wedding in order to kind of make an electronic car company a success? That's the question everyone has to answer. So I thought that was interesting to kind of expound on. Anyway, what's next is getting on the on the list here. Um, Jamie Oliver, culture appropriating of jerk chicken. Ah, man, the world is a funny place, isn't it? I don't even know. I don't even know how to begin with this one. Um, a weird story again. A weird, weird story that popped up on on social over the uh, over uh, last night. Actually, as I was staring at the ceiling. Um. <sighs> I don't get this i don't know again maybe it's just those people kind of like look for something to be offended by um maybe jamie oliver is being culturally sensitive but i just don't get the whole cultural appropriation thing anyway in general especially in england especially in london especially in britain especially in europe especially in the western world i don't actually get it right the fact that we are a multicultural society the fact that most countries within the western hemisphere you know are quite lenient when it comes to immigration you know are willing to let people in from other countries right you're going to get this right that's the whole point of like tex-mex right is that you have uh like paula alto that's on like the border of texas and mexico or you have play or you have texas for in general that's kind of next to mexico right and you have these people from mexico who are immigrating into the u.s they're kind of bringing their culinary dishes or their culinary experiences their culinary tastes to america and it's kind of getting fused. Then you have people getting in relationships, people finding friendships, and starting their own business up and kind of mixing the both things. Like there was an era in in restaurants when that was a popular thing. You'd have a, a, a couple, a Korean lady and a guy from London, right? And they'll get together and they'll make like this comp, this kind of like you know fusion food, right? Mixing uh, her Korean roots with his British roots, right? Or someone French, someone Italian, right? Someone Argentinian, someone Brazilian. That was what that was what food culture was about for a while. It's kind of like the vo in vogue. Now it's kind of kind of not gone to that kind of direction. Everyone's kind of doing their own. Everyone's kind of uh, going back to the more traditional side of things for the most part. But that was what fusion food was about. And if anything, that's what multiculturalism is about, right? The idea that you can get all these people from different cultures who have all kind of assimilated under the uh, under the kind of umbrella of Great Britain, Europe, uh, US, whatever, and have kind of, you know, brought their food into that community. So if Jamie Oliver is making jerk chicken, that is a, that is a kind of a, a win for multiculturalism, right? That is a win. Um, that shows that, you know, we have um, that Caribbean culture has integrated itself well enough into the UK um, zeitgeist or to the UK consciousness that they're willing to accept a mass market version of jerk. But the whole article is just, it's just, fun, it's just weird. Anyway, I'll read the whole thing just to kind of get an idea of what the issue is. So this article on the BBC reads as following, put up on here. Uh, Jamie Oliver's jerk rice... Um, accused of cultural appropriation so let me get up on the screen i'll link it again and show this if you're watching this via the if you listen to via the audio podcast so it says the following um 
Jamie, Jamie Oliver's uh, Jamie Oliver has been accused of culture appropriation uh, for calling a new product punchy jerk rice. The decision to label the microwaveable rice uh, jerk has been criticized because the product doesn't contain many ingredients traditionally used in the German in the Jamaican uh, jerk marinade. I'm just wondering, do you know what Jamaican jerk uh, actually is? MP Dawn Butler asked for celebrity chef. He said he used a name to show where he drew his culinary creation from, which makes sense, right? J uh, jerk seasoning is usually used on chicken. The dish is often barbecued. Jerk rice isn't really a thing, which is why a lot of people reacted angry to Jamie's new position, which doesn't make sense. If jerk isn't a thing, it doesn't exist. Why do you care? I guess the same thing of the Ruby Rose and Catwoman stuff, right? Catwoman is a made up character, right? But they were getting angry that it was now a lesbian. It's like, what? Does it really matter what sexual what are sexual what are sexual preferences? The character that is not real, it's made up. Like I get the whole idea of like, you know, casting like a comic book character who's a comic book character that's Asian and then getting a white guy to play it is annoying, right? I get that because you know it's an Asian character. It's like if you if you have a Ryu and Ken and they happen to be, I don't know, from Africa or some shit, and you get some proper white dudes to play them. I get the annoyance of it, but this is a product that is usually used on chicken and he's not used it on rice and people are saying culture so if you made jerk seasoned lollipops will people get angry about that too hmm anyway it continues jerk rice isn't really a thing and then it says um someone tweeted uh regina holland there's no such thing as jerk rice apart from what jamie oliver has co uh, con concluded that's her point anybody from any nationality can st eat anything they want there are just some dishes that are best left alone and enjoyed how they're supposed to be made, which is it, which is super stupid because most of the culinary advances are um, when people do things that you're not meant to do, mixing shit that doesn't make sense to mix because that's what's, you know, it just, again, I'm just baffled at this kind of stuff. I, I don't understand what's going on here. Uh, and another person writes, uh, no, but I'm honestly upset about Jamie. He's uh, Jamie. Oh, what did I say? Let me read this again. These tweets are really weird to read. No, but I'm honestly upset about this Jamie Oliver jerk rice. Rice can jerk? Friggin' yam head. Only two things can jerk. And chicken and pork. Little tiffin boy them. They love to copy other people's things and sell it. Hardly even know what term mean. Some people would argue you don't know how to speak English, but hey. Um, I'm still not over this jerk rice nonsense. Just no, Jamie Oliver. No. Jackie M. writes. Uh, Tim, there is no such thing as jerk rice. This is some white lady saying this, right? Jamie Oliver puts it on his product recipe to make money. That is appropriation of culture. I don't know, and I don't, and I'm not sure I care to be honest. I'm not sure I put it on list. I don't, I don't really give a shit. I'm gonna be a complete loss. I don't care. I think cultural preparation is dumb. I think the people that are worrying about this have too much time on their hands, and I think Jim Oliver should be free to call his rice whatever he wants to call it. Um, if if there's no such thing as jerk rice and he's making jerk rice, why do you care? Um, if he's promoting the idea that he got this idea, he got this idea of putting the jerk seasoning on some rice from Jamaican culture, that is only enhancing Jamaican culture. If people want to get jerk chicken from a traditional place, they'll go to a traditional place. No one is confusing Jay Oliver's jerk chicken or jerk rice with anything a regular Caribbean shop would make. Point blank and simple. That's it. I don't care. Like it's not. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand why everything has to be a, uh, uh, a some sort of ideology, ideologically based battle. You know, between uh, the haves and the haves nots. It's not always about that. If Jamie Oliver is being inspired by the coloring delights of the Caribbean, that's a good thing. That shows that the Caribbean culture has been able to permeate into pop culture. That's great. That's cool. That means everyone does enjoy jerk chicken. It's not something that's like super spicy. I remember being in school and having kids and white kids in my school be like, oh, it's so spicy, right? And it's like, what? Right? It's like a jollof rice when people first eat jollof rice that aren't, that aren't black they're like, oh my god it's so spicy spicy this is nothing if you're talking about spice right but the fact that it's been able to permeate into popular culture and people are now not that afraid of eating spice right maybe you know you've seen those um the hot ones that show with um sean evans has blown up people are not that uh, um are not that against eating spicy food you know some of the some of the asian food is kind of again permeated back into pop culture so it's like that's a good thing but again, if people want the real deal, Holyfield, they will go to the real deal. It's they're not confusing Jamie Oliver's jerk rice with anything else, some um, 
you know a traditional local caribbean food uh restaurant is making no one's doing that and even if he does decide to open because i think maybe people are, are being a bit nervous because maybe jamie oliver might decide to open a restaurant a jamaican themed restaurant even if he does decide to make it just make your own I don't get this idea. I don't. I don't understand what this whole thing is happening. Like when people make Italian themed restaurants that have no Italians working in it, I don't see anyone protesting about this shit. When you go into an Asian, we got. I've got. There's a few Asian. There's there's a, there's an Asian restaurant here that's called like I don't know like Dancing Dragon or some shit, right? That has loads of like kind of like uh, Far Eastern kind of iconography on the outside, like you know lions and golden castles and shit. And it's all people and everyone that works in there is from Pakistan, like everyone, and they still like like standard like you know chinese food in there like quote unquote chinese takeaway food and everyone i works in is pakistani no one's protesting at that shop no one's standing outside with pickets like oh my god it's not traditional if you want people pe no one goes there don't get me wrong super empty but let the public decide okay we're not going to go there because there's loads of asian dudes working in there we're going to go to the actual norm an actual chinese shop right with an actual chinese lady in there serving you food right no one wants to go into a, a Chinese shop full of like free Pakistani dudes. Unfortunately, it's just the facts of the matter. Isn't it? It's like that Louis C.K. Louis C.K. joke, right? You go into an Italian pizzeria and you see three black ladies working in there. It's like, huh? Like again, let 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 the public decide, right? If we don't want that, we don't. We just won't go to Jamie Oliver's jerk chicken rice place. We just won't go. We just okay. Why we want jerk chicken rice? We don't want that. We'll go somewhere else. Let's just let the public decide. It's such a bizarre, 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 bizarre um, outrage. That's happening as a society now. People just got way too much time. There's so much things you can worry about. And you're worrying about Jamie Oliver's jerk chicken rice. It's like, huh? It's a mac and it's microwaveable too. It's in a packet. Who cares, man? Fuck. Anyway, what's next on the list? I don't know why I put this again. It just made me angry. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. 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 Oh, Jamie Oliver. Um, sorry, Kanye West is making millions of Yeezys. I'm happy about this. Um, Kanye West has spoken a lot has spoken a lot about um, the, his kind of dream of uh, turning Yeezy into a billion dollar company, uh, making sure he could dress um, college basketball teams, making sure he can outfit the world, of make sure the world is being given Yeezys. And obviously so far, so, so far, he's been able to implement that, right? Because if you look on the most metropolitan streets or cities and stuff, you see more people wearing Yeezys than I've ever seen in my life, right? So I think with each iteration, they've been able to ramp up production little by little and more people get, uh, they're holding them. Of course, the first kind of versions of the Yeezy are still quite limited. You can't really get a hold of them. They're still um, very much in demand. I think if we actually, let me actually go on the Yeezy site and I can see, because I think the first batch of shoes are the ones that are probably the hardest to get a hold of because i think they've got they've got an archive they just put up again recently that everyone was kind of getting getting in uh that was getting all hot and bothered about and people are fucking making uh this rumor up that they were gonna release everything from the back catalog which i'm not sure that's actually true but um let me see if i can get up here where is it there's like an archive right where is it is that archive where's the archive uh, yeezy Let's see, Yeezy Archive. Let me get up on here, see if I can view it all. <clears throat> but yeah, so um, each each iteration of the shoe has obviously run some production, but now he kind of really wants to uh, ramp it up even more. But I think the first couple of ones you just can't get a hold of, but they're just, you know, they're really, really hard to get a hold of. But this is, um, this is sort of the the whole entire archive that they put up on their website, um, which has been quite cool to do. I hope a lot more companies do sort of like digital archive stuff. I'm, I know who used to do it quite often. I think Rick Owens still does it on his website. He's got like kind of like the whole archive of all the collections put together, especially the whole shows and stuff, dating back from stuff that's, that predates kind of Vogue.com stuff. And I remember Raph did it for a while. And I remember Comme des Garçons used to have this weird site. They did it too. I, it's just nice to check out and see. I think even Supreme have it, right, on their website. You can kind of see back to all of the kind of previews that they kind of put up from back in the day. But, yeah, so this is the kind of thing that they got on there. I'll show on the screen. I'm sure most of you guys have seen this, but this is the whole entire archive. So, for the most part, most of these shoes you can't get a hold of, right? They're kind of, like, super rare. They're the ones that, the first sort of inter iteration, they're kind of still going for big bucks on um, stuff like StockX and stuff. But then from the 350 V2s onwards, They've been slowly but surely ramping up production. So I'm sure most most of you people who are kind of into fashion or into kind of streetwear and stuff have seen people wearing one of these shoes, right? Around town and stuff. Some of them wearing it. Um, 
the brunette has a pair of these um i really like the zebras um these ones are quite nice too i didn't really quite like them because of that line reminded me more of the kind of mercurial vapors that everyone was wearing for a bit but these have been quite a lot more easier to get hold of and then you ramp up to the 500s which is another good example too um these have been in each color that release has been a lot more easier to get hold of too they're not going for that much money on stock x and then with the 700 twos um these came out twice i think once through user supply and once in adidas and i got a pair on stock x and then with the three 750s uh sorry the 750s as well with each color they got more easy to get the first one quite hard and then from then it kind of got easier to get and the power phase you can still find them for retail now or you can still find them on stock x for i don't know 50 dollars more than what they're worth so obviously the production of each shoe has been getting ramped up little by little they've been able to kind of improve production and make sure everyone kind of gets a hold of a pair right and i'm sure kind of his entire dream is to make sure that yeezy is kind of on the same level as jordan so they're able you're able to see them everywhere that um you know everyone's kind of wearing a pair so it's kind of welcome news that this tweet came out the other day where Kanye said the following um since i've been making sneakers i've always wanted as many people as possible to have them on september 21st we're doing our largest drop ever the 350 v2 triple whites go and use the play uh da, 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 and sign up to get them which is amazing to hear so i'm hearing rumors that they're gonna be they're gonna produce they're producing millions they're still in the millions right because before they're i think in the tens of thousands and then hundred thousands and then they're gonna be millions of them available which is gonna be interesting to see how quickly they still sell out because those guys that resell on other markets and stuff or who use bots are still gonna you know stockpile bears and just have them you know on dead stock and just you know resell them and flip them in years to come because you know the good thing about sneakers is that they hold their currency and they're kind of like you know things that you can kind of quote unquote invest in and when you're when you're when you're like short on money or you don't you know you don't have funds or you kind of want to buy something different you can always like flip them and sell them to somebody else and you know you get your money back and some on top of them so that can be interesting to see how that kind of pans out and I'm sure, so I'm guessing this is probably going to be all through you just Supply website. I'm not sure if they're going to be releasing on other stores or are people going to be releasing them to other kind of tier zero accounts and stuff. But let's see what happens. Um, again, I'm happy to see this kind of evolving. I'm hoping this is going to this is also going to relate to the 700 Wave Runners because they were meant to re-release again, but they got delayed. So I'm hoping that might be due to kind of production issues and they want to kind of ramp up production and get more of them because I would like to get another pair from myself because mine's absolutely fucked because I'm wearing them every single day. So that would be cool to see that happen too. So that was welcome news. And another Kanye-related news, he wore an amazing suit that Virgil Abloh designed that I thought looked fucking incredible, right? Um, I think, uh, what was it? Two Chains wedding, right? Yeah, Two Chains, Two Chains um, got married the other, the other day and Kim and Kanye turned up to his wedding. Um, you know, I'm sure that whole like Jay-Z not turning up to his wedding kind of thing has played in his head because he's, ev every one of his friends has got married so far. Kanye and Kim have made an effort to kind of go since Pusha and all that sort of stuff. You know, they kind of, you know, I don't know. Maybe there's a subplot there. We don't know. But the outfit is fucking insane. Really, really nice suit. Um, it might begin a new dawn because you know, Kanye has loads of copycats that kind of copy his style and want to look like him. So this might be an introduction into kind of the suit era because there has been a little bit of a movement with the whole like double double breasted blazer and can kind of be, you know, it's kind of like a, a cheat way to kind of like smarten up your outfit. It's sort of like the um, the refined version of Pharrell wearing, not Pharrell, of Usher wearing the suit jacket with the jeans. Remember that era when loads of Nigerian guys were wearing that same outfit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just like baggy jeans and a suit jacket, right? And this is kind of like the refined version of it, right? Just putting on a nice kind of vintage double-breasted double, ble double jacket with some nice jeans, some cowboy boots, uh, maybe some nice Vans, some Converse One Stars. It kind of just gives your outfit a little bit more of a refined twist. And I thought his outfit looked fucking insane. Of course, Kim looked amazing, as she always does for the most part. Um, she's always looked quite incredible these last couple of outfits, but I thought Kanye's outfit was super, super good. And especially the slides. I think in addition to the slides, it was a really nice touch of like, you know, I want to be comfortable. Of course, it's unfortunate it didn't fit him because, you know, there's pictures of him walking on the side and you can see his heel kind of dragging off. So I'm assuming these are samples. They're not in production just yet, but I love the outfit. I think the outfit is fucking amazing and he looks really, really cool. And you never know. This might be a, a start of a new age. People are actually dressing um, in suits nowadays because it's, it's a kind of movement away from the whole Tom Ford um, drain pipe, really slim tailored suit and more, in term, more into a style of a kind of a relaxed version, a kind of a, a streetwear version of what everyone's doing at Petty, right? And the guys that um, 
um, the sartorialist kind of takes a picture of, like really relaxed, you know, the kind of Italian uh, tailored suits, right? That are really relaxed fitting, that kind of like, you know, just kind of drape on the body that you can kind of wear the whole entire day. It's kind of like a, a day suit, right? You can kind of wear it to work, you can kind of wear it to dinner after, you kind of wear it to get, have a party, you take off the jacket, roll up the sleeves and kind of get with it. So let's see what happens. That might be a dawn of a new age, people wearing double breasted suits. But I thought the outfit was fucking insane. I thought it looked really, really cool, man. They both looked amazing, actually, in both their colors. And this is obviously a Virgil Abloh designed uh, kind of Louis Vuitton suit with the kind of like embossed emblems on it, which looked amazing. What else was on the docket here? Du -du 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 -du. I think, oh yeah, oh, and um, I f and to end it actually, because we're already at one hour plus already in a podcast, I don't want to keep rambling on for too long. Um, unfortunately, um, news broke the other day that the alibi, my hallowed home, my uh, sweet home Alabama, the place that kind of birthed me in some respects, um, has unfortunately closed, or is unfortunately closing at the end of the month. Um, we're not too sure if this is there's not been made aware it's not been made um insurance to clear whether or not this has anything to do with the whole hackney licensing laws that have, you know kind of like wreaked havoc on the entire borough of hackney in terms of new space not being able to open until after 12 and stuff and i'm sure you know the fact that they have to it was apply for late licenses and only get a couple of um, i don't know maybe four year or whatever many it is it's not allowing to be successful but you know it's no coincidence that this has come after that whole idea and it's just it's just unfortunate right because again alibi has been in there been a place that has been a home to me for i don't know maybe the best part of maybe since it opened maybe the best part of eight years it's been a, a home to me um it's been a place where i kind of started off my djing it's been a place where i started off uh taking pictures of club events for the most part it's been a place where i did start off putting on my own nights where i kind of was introduced to a, a new group of people who kind of introduced me to other groups of people got me into other interested to other bands interested to um other artists interested to other things in general um, I went on holiday with a couple of people that I met there. I met some people on holiday that I met there. Um, you know, romance blossomed there. Um, bro harps were broken there. Um, egos were damaged there. Money was made there. Money was lost there. Loads of things happened in that tiny basement club. And I've only got really good memories of it. It maybe didn't end the way everyone kind of wanted it to end, you know, towards the end. Um, I guess it, no, it was no coincidence that, you know, the kind of whole licensing thing took effect. Some of the promoters that used to work there were kind of like fell out with some of the owners that happened to be uh, the owners of the, of, of the space itself. And I'm sure some of the licensing laws kind of took effect and not everyone was kind of given the opportunity to kind of have more nights or to run stuff late as possible to kind of get more money, blah, 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 blah. So stuff happened towards the end, but overall they were able to kind of steer through all those kind of stormy waters and kind of come out at the other end. And the fact that what, what I really appreciate and what I really respect about the alibi is that they were able to kind of reinvent themselves, right? Because again, like I mentioned, I hope, I wish I could find that quote who said it, but there is a kind of common um, theme that runs in nightlife where it says that most clubs and bars have like a four year cycle, right? Um, where they kind of have to either reinvent themselves or they die, right? Because um, the people that kind of start with you in year one don't necessarily um, continue after year four. So you kind of have to constantly have a fresh amount. You've got to have fresh people coming in and kind of like reinventing the space and kind of taking back the reins and kind of putting on their own nights and stuff. And I mean, because essentially like I couldn't necessarily be a promoter at the Alibi no more because I don't really hang out in that area anymore i'm not plugged in as much as i was there anymore i don't have as much quote-unquote clout as i did back in the day in order to kind of draw a crowd or to kind of get people to come out or have my pulse on who the djs are that people like in that scene anymore so you have to have people that are coming in who are a bit younger who don't have as much experience to kind of come in with fresh eyes and a fresh approach and kind of take the mantle and kind of take it again and kind of take the club forward again um, and, if they, and they did really well in doing that. They kind of they probably they did the best of anyone on that strip in terms of surviving um, loads of different kind of weird eras and periods. But it seems as if like now they've kind of taken the decision to kind of like close the doors and kind of move on to passage new. Maybe it has nothing to do with the hacking Ladson laws. Maybe it's just like a, a good occasion to close it because now that whole that whole group um, of real gold has like five miles. They have Rita's. They have Pamela's. They have a few other places opening up, I think, soon as well. So they have a lot of stuff on their plates now that they probably need to concentrate a lot on. And maybe, you know, Alibi has kind of run its course in that respect. So it might make sense just to kind of like, you know, kind of like... Uh 
hang up the gloves and kind of end on a high note in that respect. But yeah, so they put out a statement here, which I'll kind of read out quickly, but um, which was kind of sad to see again, because again, like I said, it's my spiritual home. But I guess, you know, all good things must come to an end in some respects. So they re they write here on Facebook the following. Um, we have some sad news to share. After eight years of service, we've made a difficult, very difficult decision to close the alibi at the end of the month. It's been one of the hardest decisions we've ever had to make. The bar honestly means more to us than we can really put into words. We swore to ourselves that we'd never, ever, ever close by choice, ever. The ethos of the alibi was always to be free entry bar that forever reflected the neighborhood that we were in. We've lived through the pipses of 2010, the 18 year olds of 2012, the deep V shirts of 2014, and the griminess of 2014. 2016. It was always important to us that the door stayed open, but it feels like the right time to let go of the alibi, which is true. That whole period was mad. I was through. I was there through the whole time. You know, it's mad. I think I put on my first night in 2011. I think so on the alibi. So it's fucking insane to see how long that's been around, man. Um, part of the charm of the alibi was that on the surface we were messy, unorganized and uninterested. The reality is that behind the scenes you'd be hard pressed to meet a bunch of people that cared much more, that cared uh, cared more. From our sound system to our hiring, our entrance policy to our drinking pricing, we thought about how people used our bar at every single possible moment, which is very true. The prices of the drinks, they were very fair. The bouncers were always cool. You always made up good relationships with people in there, you know, being friends with them. People that worked in there were really, really safe as well. It was just a good environment overall. I thought for the most part to get fucking absolute hammered in, right? Um, and, la, 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 and it continues. We would like to take this opportunity to thank absolutely every person that's ever worked behind the bar. All the DJs, the promoters who started their careers here and each guest that's ever strolled down our steps only to stumble uh, up a, a couple hours later. We're really proud um, to have served you and all you mean a great deal to us. Although Dino is having a baby and Mark is contemplating a quieter life, we're still going to be busy pushing on with Pamela down the road, our club five miles, a restaurant Toshi, uh, Hell Brewing in Seven Sisters, plus uh, various real gold related fun so it makes sense right they've got like one two three four uh f basically five things on the go so maybe it's just a good time to close and it continues we can't wait to see what gem does uh with uh with the space and we're pleased the bar stays and someone that cares much as we do so i'm not sure who gem is maybe i do know the person so someone says in their group is on their friendship group is taking over the space and probably gonna do their own thing in there but it's a it's disappointing that it's gonna close i'm sure it's gonna so it's closing maybe to be again renamed something else um but the major people won't be involved anymore. But yeah, RIP Alibi, man. Like, I've had... That's where I kind of started um, my career in general in terms of DJing, in terms of promoting parties, meeting new people and stuff. So it means a great, 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 great deal to me. I haven't been there in a long, long time since it's since I've basically just kind of like stepped away from kind of hanging out on that strip in general and kind of concentrated more of my time, uh, all my energy, all my money, making sure that I go to nightclubs and see like DJs that I kind of, you know, actual DJs and club nights and stuff. But it still holds a real dear part, um, a dear space in my heart. And of course, I'm going to be going there before it closes at the end of the month to kind of, you know, wish them well and stuff. But yeah, RIP Alibi, um, you, you are gone but never forgotten. Um, I hope they do a good piece of merch as well. Like that would be sick. I hope they do some merch. Um, to kind of commemorate the eight years of absolute success that they've had. Hope they do some kind of uh, exhibition. That'd be cool to kind of commemorate because I've got loads of pictures actually. So if those guys ever want pictures, they can holler at me. Um, I've got loads of pictures of the kind of from the first time being there when there was nothing, there was kind of curtains and shit, no sign. So that'd be cool to kind of get up in there as well. So loads of things um, they could do to kind of commemorate the whole issue. Maybe they can put out a big coffee table book that'd be super pretentious but really cool as well. But yeah, RIP Alibi, man. Like an, a, a, an institution in London is fi has finally closed its doors. And I wish all of the real golf family and all the ex alibi employees much success in the future. Um, I'm sure they'll be successful in whatever else they do because they always smash it. Anyway, um, that is me for the X News English episode number 97. I've been blabbering on for far too long now. I need to crack on all my other endeavors for the day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for listening to me speak. As always, um, I have links at the bottom of this video and if you listen to this video, the audio podcast in the description, you'll be able to see links to my website, stuff that I get up to and stuff, whatever, social media accounts, blah, 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 blah. Um, on Friday, uh, I'll be DJing at Tap East, as always, on Friday at Tap East, I'll be DJing for a night called Tapped alongside my very good friend Afro Munza. So I'll be on from 7 to 11. If you're in the area and you want to see me spin some tunes at Westfield, come down, hang out, have a boozer. And then on Sunday, I'm also DJing again at the late and um, at the Heathcote and Star from my other night called Labatee. So it's a Bank Holiday special from five until one. 
So that should be another good times as well. Playing again alongside Afro Musa again. Keep it in the family. And then I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be I'm gonna be at Carnival on Monday. So if you guys are around, if anyone's about an, uh, on Carnival on Monday and you see me around, say hi, big up your boy, and let's hang out a little bit and have a couple of drinks here and there. But anyway, this has been Negative News English Show, episode number 97. I'm going to see you guys again tomorrow for another episode. Thanks so much for tuning in. 